are actually getting started right this second. Uh, thank you very much for joining us tonight here in the room on a beautiful evening fit to welcome the royal couple. Um, <laughs> and thank you for joining us on Zoom. Uh, it is hard to believe that the holiday season is upon us. It's also hard to believe prices. Uh, if anyone has done any holiday baking recently, you may have noticed that a pound of butter uh, costs fully 18% more right now than it did just last year. Uh, so in today's economy, a lot of factors contribute to high prices, uh, supply chain kinks, war in Ukraine, labor shortages, uh, or is globalization the culprit? Um, is it even as widespread, actually, as we believe? So as Shannon O'Neill uh, discusses in her book, The Globalization Myth, uh, that is not necessarily the case. Rather, regionalization is the dynamic we should be talking about, which we will. Maybe not holiday baking, but regionalization. So I'm Mary Eintema. I'm the president of World Boston, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to our final chat and chatter of 2022. Uh, we're joined tonight, obviously, by people in the room and also by folks on Zoom. <clears throat> and we are in uh, the room of our very kind hosts, Foley and Lardner. Um, our board member, James DeVellis, can't be with us, but we have a couple of other excellent friends from Foley, and we thank you very much uh, for your hospitality. Um, I also want to shout out Natalie Mace, who is behind the scenes um, and literally behind the Zoom. Uh, <laughs> she is our Director of Operations and Global Engagement Programs. Um, and uh, several other World Boston colleagues you've seen around. I want to point out also board members along with colleagues. So if you're a colleague or a board member, raise your hand. Um, <clears throat> and uh, if this is your first World Boston event, raise your hand. You should all talk to each other. <laughs> all right, onward. Uh, a couple of quick reminders. As you may know, the mission of World Boston is to foster international engagement and global cooperation. So we thank you for being part of that mission and hope you'll learn more about World Boston and if you can support our work financially. Yeah. All right, and then finally, I wanna apologize ahead of time. I've been criticized by friends of mine. When I use my phone at these events, I am not ordering from Grubhub. <laughs> um, I am, uh, that's the way that I'm communicating with my colleagues. So I apologize ahead of time. All right, at very long last, I'm so happy that we're joined tonight by Shannon O'Neill. Um, I'm gonna abbreviate her outstanding bio, but you can read it in full um, at worldboston.org. By the way, um, I really know what I'm saying when I'm saying I'm excited because Natalie and I actually just saw you present at the World Affairs Council's uh, National Conference in DC. <clears throat> we will all learn something tonight. Um, so Shannon K. O'Neill is the Vice President of Studies uh, and Nelson and David Rockefeller Senior Fellow for Latin American Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. She is an expert on Latin America, global trade, US-Mexico relations, corruption, democracy, and immigration. In addition to the globalization myth, which we'll be selling and she'll be signing after our Zoom, uh, she is also the author of Two Nations Indivisible, Mexico, the United States, and the Road Ahead, a columnist for Bloomberg Opinion and a frequent guest on national broadcast news and radio programs. I'm just gonna jump ahead, <clears throat> pardon me, in the interest of time, because I think we're going to have a lot of really good discussion tonight. So let us jump right in. Um, the title of the book provokes a lot of questions uh, in my mind. First of all, we should, we should say we're talking about, when we're talking about globalization tonight, we really mean uh, primarily an economic Mm -hmm. phenomenon rather than climate change or diseases, things like that. Um, so globalization myth. Um, did you know, Shannon O'Neill, <laughs> that 74 languages are spoken in Boston public schools? Um, certainly in our lifetime, it seems that globalization has exploded. Uh, so um, why is this a myth? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Good opening question. And nice to be here with all of you. Thanks for coming out on a rainy night. Um, and I do look at it mostly from an economic point of view, though there is some aspect of migration and the like there. Um, but overall, when you look at, we talk a lot about globalization, right? We hear about it on the news, we hear about global supply chains. Um, I'm sorry about your butter. Um, but, 
but when we look at um, these issues, we sort of see globalization as widespread, maybe it's inevitable, um, but it's sort of this juggernaut. And when I started researching the book and looking at the economic data, it's not quite that. Uh, and when you look at these last 40 years, these are the years of internationalization and the rise of global supply chains and the like, there are only about two dozen countries that really saw their economies transformed with trade. So, you know, trade as part of their economies doubled or more. Um, and in contrast, there are dozens of other countries, almost 90 countries, that saw trade as part of their GDP, as part of their economy, stay the same, stagnate, or even decline. So they deglobalized over these last 40 years. So when I talk about this globalization myth, one big aspect of it is not all that many countries actually participated in this supposed opening up of the global economy. So let's talk a little bit more about regionalization. Um, please help us understand um, why, um, why it's, it's that and not globalization that we're dealing with. And then, you know, the question that follows very quickly on it, so let's get at the same time, how do we understand what regionalization is? And on the whole, is it a good thing? Mm -hmm. Sure. So one side of this is that globalization wasn't as prevalent as we think. And the other side of this is when companies went abroad, when money went abroad, when people look for suppliers or look for customers abroad, they didn't very often go to the other side of the world. Mm -hmm. um, so we can point to examples, of course, of companies that are global, right? You can look at Boeing and you can see that it sources from 58 different countries. So sure, there are global companies, but alongside these high profile, the Boeings or the Coca-Colas or the Nikons or the like, you have thousands, tens of thousands of companies that did go abroad, did go international, but they went much closer. And you know, an interesting data point here is that the average good that is traded, so a good that goes abroad, goes 3,000 miles. And 3,000 miles is about the distance from Boston to Los Angeles. That does not get you to Shanghai. It doesn't get you to Berlin. It is a much shorter distance. And so, yes, some company, some countries opened up. Just you know, about two dozen opened up and really transformed their economy. So few got involved. And when they did, they were much more likely to trade and to tie themselves economically to other countries nearby. So you have sort of the creation of regions in this last 40 years. So instead of saying global supply chains, in many ways, they're regional supply chains, particularly in the making of things. Um, and so regionalization here, that is more prevalent, I would say, than globalization where companies or money went to the other side of the world. Um, and that I think is really misunderstood. It's misunderstood in some ways uh, because we think about it as everybody's going all over the world, which which they're not as often. Um, and then it's also, you know, we here in the United States talk a lot about, you know, the good of globalization that there's cheap prices. Maybe your butter wouldn't cost so much. But the downside of globalization that you know some communities have been hollowed out, some businesses have gone to other places. But we need to understand sort of why that happens. So is regionalization good or bad? I would say actually that regionalization is quite good and. The challenge for the United States and some of these communities and, and US-based companies and workers is not too much globalization, but too little regionalization. Hmm. Okay. So I'm um, within that kind of thought bubble, I want to ask, isn't isn't this in some ways good or bad? We we believe at the moment it's good, <laughs> what you're telling us. Um, isn't this just an artifact of trade agreements um, in, in the book? And um Let's talk about it more. You talk about how we're essentially emerging into three, three zones, yeah. right? Uh, China, et cetera, Europe, um, and and America. Um, so coincidentally, uh, there's some trade agreements at play there. So when you look at these last 40 years, what you have seen in this regionalization are three big regions. You see Europe, Asia, and North America. The rest of the world, Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, South Asia, they really have not regionalized. They've been left on the margins of this creation of supply chains, uh, often at the, you know, the ends where they ship out commodities or they bring back finished goods, but they're not part of this production process as much. Um, and what you have seen is different paths to get there. So if you look at these last 40 years, Europe took a very top-down trade or trade agreement heavy approach to it. So, you know, if you read European history, they have, you know, the Treaty of Rome, the Treaty of Nice, the Treaty of Maastricht, the Treaty of Lisbon, the Treaty of almost every big city where diplomats got together and 
took down tariffs. They took down regular, you know, regulatory barriers. Uh, they took down. Uh, they created one passport. Um, they even created one currency. So they sort of brought it together through agreements. Interestingly, in Asia, you see this integration uh, really being led by CEOs, being led by mm -hmm. companies. Mm -hmm. There was an assist by governments. Governments would say, "Oh, you know, it started with the Japanese." So the Japanese needed uh, in the 1960s. Um, they were running out of labor and manpower, so they started outsourcing to countries at the time that were incredibly poor, South Korea and Taiwan. Uh, and so CEOs went there, they would bring along bureaucrats and the bureaucrats might build a port or you know, provide development assistance, um, but it was in free trade agreements. In fact, you don't really see free trade agreements in Asia until the 1990s after this integration had already been going mm -hmm. in full force. Uh, and then I would say, you know, look to North America and the free trade agreement it was NAFTA, it's now called the USMCA, it's gone through a few permutations. Um, but it was sort of the, the Goldilocks middle of these, from the top down, very heavy on treaties, the bottom up, not all that many treaties, but led by companies. And I would say it's a Goldilocks middle, but not in a good way, the way we usually think about the Goldilocks middle, in that it wasn't enough of institutions to sort of force movement or, or to, to bring you know, infrastructure investment and the like. Um, but it also wasn't enough industries and as broad enough across um, the various economic bases and bringing in enough countries that... Um, you, saw, you see the dynamism that, you know, that has happened in Asia, where they really have regionalized and become, and in that process, become really the biggest area of the world in terms of producing goods. They produce almost half of the global goods that are out there, but in large part because of this regionalization. Okay, great. So let's um, talk on a very, very big picture. Let us talk about Akron, Ohio. Yeah. Uh, why? Uh, partly because uh, that's where because you we're in Boston. <laughs> because we're in Boston, and um, and it's I think when many of us think of places like Akron, Ohio, we we understand that in in these days to mean something particular about the experience of globalization or regionalization. So, um, in 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 these places are often represented <clears throat> as victims of globalization. So is, is that the case? Um, and how should a place like Akron um, react to or participate in regionalization? Yeah. So I grew up in Akron, Ohio. Uh, for those who haven't spent time in lovely Akron, uh, at one point, in, especially in the, you know, the 50s and 60s, it was, they, would, they would refer to themselves as you know, the tire capital of the world. They were producing you know, half of the tires that were being produced in the world. It was a quite... Mm -hmm prosperous place. Lots of people migrated there to work. And so, you know, it was a booming type of town. Uh, and then in the 70s and, and early 80s, it really lost all that economic dynamism. And in fact, the last tire came off of an Akron assembly line in 1982. Uh, and the U.S. tire companies that were all based there in Akron, um, they faced competition from, from Japanese companies, from French companies and German companies, and, and they were all really sold off to those companies. And this is often held up, as you say, as sort of the you know, hallmark or example of this is what globalization does, right? It, it hallowed out that town. Um, but I would say that it actually was limited regionalization that played a, perhaps a bigger part. And so as the Akron companies were facing competitors, they're facing Japanese competitors, those Japanese competitors and the auto companies that they served had already regionalized. They were producing across Asia, and by doing that, they were able to produce high quality and pretty low cost goods. Uh, you see the same thing from Michelin, which is a French company, Continental, a German company. They were part of the European community at the time, which is now the EU, but at the time, and they were selling all across Europe. So they had big markets, economies of scale, and also able to produce. So they had something that Akron, Ohio, uh, with NAFTA a decade away, didn't have. They didn't, weren't able to go and, and reach out and, and lower their cost base um, and also sort of increase their innovation because they were alone. And you saw it disappear in the 1980s. And I, you know, I'll provide sort of a counterfactual to that. Um, this was another town I looked at and in, in industry I looked at. Um, so similar to Akron, Ohio, at least in, in, in type, uh, is, is uh, Columbus, Indiana. I don't know if any of you have been there, um, but Columbus, Indiana is uh, in Indiana. Okay. Um, it is a home of Cummins Engines. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so yes. Cummins Engines is a, a big engine company. It was formed during the, between the two world wars. Um, by a, a native of, of uh, Columbus, Indiana. 
and it boomed too in the in the post-war period you know selling engines to for cars for the big automakers also for trucks and the like um, and it too fell in hard times in the 1970s and 80s and it was getting beat out by Japanese engine makers, which were more affordable and, and higher quality, they were selling now to Ford and GM and the like, and, and sort of boxing them out. Um, they were also facing competition from you know, BMW and Mercedes and others too, who had this big common market and then were beginning to sell into the United States. Um, so they were almost you know, on the brink of going under. And I would argue that actually NAFTA saved Cummins engines. Um, with NAFTA, they were able to move part of the production assembly of some of their, their engines to Mexico. So they lowered the cost. They were able to compete with the Japanese for US-based market. They also got access to Mexico's market, which they had not had before. Uh, and in fact, Cummins became the number one brand for Mexican trucks. If you go to Mexico and you know some big truck tries to run you off the road, which they sometimes do, um, it will be a Cummins engine probably that was that was driving them or you know helping them get up that hill. Um, and by doing that, they actually built and expanded a huge plant in upstate New York um, that actually builds those engines. But they were able to get back on their feet, and now they're a big global competitor again, precisely because they could divide up those costs and benefit from the specialization and the economies of scale and things that you know the Europeans and Asians already were. Great, thank you. So now let's look at you know sort of the national level, having thought about a place. So um, if this is happening. Um, aided perhaps by the SMCA, um, if regionalization is, is happening, um, how do we, the United States, um, best participate in it? Um, and how are we doing relative to other participants in, in regionalization? So North America has fallen behind Asia and Europe. And just to throw out a couple of numbers so you get a sense of the scale here, in, in Europe, sort of two thirds or so of the trade is within Europe. So they basically make things together and they sell them to each other. Um, Asia has seen its intra-regional trade and, and money flows go from about 30% in 1980 to 60% today. So they've seen a huge integration and regionalization. In part, it's they make things together, um, though increasingly they're selling to each other um, as Asian consumers have more spending power. And we're going to see more and more of that, I think, as we go forward. North America, uh, right before NAFTA, about 40%, or as NAFTA came into force, about 40% of trade was between Mexico, Canada, and the United States. So 40, you know, 40 cents out of every dollar. In the decade after NAFTA was signed, that rose to 47, 48%. So you see a pretty big increase. Almost half of the trade was within the block. And then starting in the 2000s, when China comes into the WTO, that number falls back again, and you go back down to 40%. So Yes, there's a good amount of regional trade here, for sure, and certain industries, the auto industry, aerospace, uh, food processing and the like, there's, there's pretty tight connections in a regional production platform, um, but it's not as widespread or pervasive as you see in the other parts of the world. Um, and I think that's partly uh, why other places sometimes have a commercial advantage over the United States. You know, we talk a lot about here, and you've probably heard in the news recently, um, you know, the competition with China and, and competing, mm -hmm. and, you know, we've heard it, you know, trying to keep Chinese imports out and the like. Um, but I think we need to remember, it's not China alone, it's Asia that's making those, you know, quite competitive, affordable products that that get sent into the United States often. And, and here, I think in that, you know, manufacturing, especially this part of, of global trade, um, has really become a team sport. It goes across countries, and if you try to do it alone, which you know some of the rhetoric and some of the policies in the United States uh, seems to lean towards the Buy American policies, you're going to end up with more expensive products that maybe you have the protection you can sell here in the United States, but you're going to forfeit those you know 7.5 billion consumers that are outside our borders. Okay, thanks. So, uh, a really conceptual question for you, but. Um, about 150 years ago, when I was in graduate school, um, riding my dinosaur around DuPont Circle, um, you know, we what we talked about is that uh, trade is is not a political, you know, in, in in classical sense, trade is not a political activity. You know, markets are markets. Um, with regionalization, with regional trade agreements. Um, can that continue to be true and should it? I mean, the, the CHIPS Act, um, we could look at as a very strategic um, geopolitical um, piece of, of legislation, not just one to enhance uh, competition. 
so if you look back at the the 90s and 2000s, I think that was the height of this, you know, market driven approach and, and, on the nose. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and countries um, at least aspired rhetorically, they didn't always do it. Um, but the, the aspiration was that we're going to open more markets, right? We're leaning towards opening. It may take some time, but we're, we're going to put in place and, you know, the the GATT, which was the before the WTO, is there you transformed to the WTO, which had more teeth. It had an arbitration mechanism. It had sort of a way to force countries to behave. Or you know, not anymore. But um, but they were doing that. So you sort of had this movement that direction. And I think one of the most striking things over the last decade or so, even before COVID, but accelerated by COVID, is lots of countries pulling back from that. So rhetorically, no longer saying those things, and many many more countries jumping on to um, and eager to put in place industrial policies. So here, mm -hmm. the state guiding markets and guiding particular sectors. And yeah. there's lots of reasons they're doing this. Like one is old fashioned economic competition, which is what industrial policy has often been, right? That in 20th century, sort of your, your grandmother or grandfather's industrial policy was about economic competition, you know, getting into new industries or protecting the ones you already had that were a little slow to, you know, to adapt. Um, but today, I think there's a lot of goals out there and some justifiable. You know, one of the goals is to stop climate change and lower the temperature of, of the world and change energy matrices so we don't, you know, overheat here. And that's, you know, a goal that you would need governments to step in, as we found to do. Um, we also have goals here in the United States. We have goals of you know, domestic equity and inclusion, right? You know, the Biden administration's other talk about a worker-centered trade policy and these sorts of things. It's hard to know sometimes what that means, but but overall, this idea that you should use the government to sort of influence markets in the way that companies set mm -hmm. themselves up, that's there too. As you said, with the CHIPS Act, there are national security concerns, mm -hmm. right? The United States has decided that it doesn't want to be dependent on, uh, you know, products and chips that were that are made in China or equipment that would have chips that might have surveillance here in the United States or just be dependent on China for for lots of things for critical minerals for medicines for you know the masks all those sorts of things in in particular areas so there's lots of reasons governments want to step back in and are eager to step back in um, whether it's going to be good or bad is a different question but I do think what we're going to see is more and more managed markets and particularly in sectors um, that governments believe are important for national security and this is much more broadly construed um, this isn't just hypersonic jets this is you know access to uh, all kinds of medicines to electric vehicle batteries say you know the green transition to the technologies there so this is something that you know the trade that you were that you learned in grad school and I learned in grad school that theory and that that is um I think you know, in the decline, and we're going to see this other side much more ascendant. Um, what that means, I think, is not the end of internationalization, right? It's not the end of international trade or the movement of money, because outside of a very few sectors, governments are not going to be willing to subsidize indefinitely industries. You know, mm -hmm. semiconductors mm -hmm. might be the exception, mm -hmm. um, and they have been for decades, but other things, you know, we're not going to subsidize the making of microphones or TVs or all sorts of other things. So these are going to, profits and losses are going to matter. And it's, we have seen, it's just too, too darn efficient and profitable uh, to spread production across countries. Uh, international supply chains have arisen for a reason and that they're very competitive. They're very profitable mm -hmm. and efficient. And so that is going to continue, I think, um, even as governments sort of put their finger on the scale for particular types of products and industries. Okay, great. Um, this is a topic that um, I could ask a lot more questions about, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to invite you, my friends, um, to please uh, come on up to the microphone if you have questions. Um, Northeastern University. Um, two quick ones. One, the auto pact. I thought that Akron, Ohio could have benefited even back in the 60s from the auto pact with Canada. And the second question was, Alan Rugman, as you noted in your book, uh, I talked about the demise of or the, the fiction of globalization 20 years ago, and he favored, he, he showed data on regionalization. I'm very glad that you brought this back up. Yeah, great. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Um, well, as I'll start with that last one. Just, I think it is fascinating. If you look back at some of the writings in the 1970s and 80s, 
there was a lot of talk about this and partly because Japan was ascendant and there were you know people writing about there's triads there's Germany and Japan and the US and the US is you know Japan is going to beat us and all these sorts of things there's all this sort of literature and then you get to the 90s and sort of the 2000s and all of a sudden you have you know you have Wall Street bankers writing about the BRICS uh, you know so Brazil Russia India China and so that's a different kind of, of setup you have people like Fareed Zakaria who who I love but writing about you know the rise of the rest a multipolar world and you get to move away from this and so partly in writing this book it was to get back to that, that there's this concept but there's this reality that even though people sort of stopped talking about it in the 80s or 70s or 80s it's just continued to deepen um, this this regional tendency and, and grow. So so I'm, I'm glad. I think Alan Rugman's stuff is great. So um, so so that's on that part. On the other, oh, the auto packs. Yeah, you know um, there was that agreement between between Canada uh, and the United States. Um, which did help a lot with the car companies, I would say, and indefinitely helped in sort of the tit for tat that had been happening and, and sort of allow, you know, make sure that Canada and the United States didn't try to create separate auto industries, which which would neither of them would have been, you know, had the economies of scale. And, and I think in many ways back in the 60s and 70s saved the auto industry in, in the sense of allowing a little bit of, of an economies of scale. Um, but somehow, you know, that didn't carry over into the tires uh, and in part um, because as, GM and Ford and others were trying to go international. The, the U.S. tire companies, the Akron-based tire companies, weren't able to follow them. They hadn't quite set up the structures. This was sort of their own problems, I would say. The only one who, who really did set up an international footprint at the time was Goodyear, and the rest, um, for whatever reasons, decided not to. Um, and there's other challenges that they had at the time. But that auto pact, I think, was too limited, frankly, because it really just covered autos. It wasn't a larger investment treaty, which is what NAFTA was. Um, it wasn't a larger commercial treaty um, that set up for you know other things besides the autos um, to really cover them. So I think it, it left so much more on the table um, than, than we would have seen otherwise. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, Raul, go ahead. Raul, I have a premise and a question. The premise uh, okay. is the properties below the middle of the wealth spectrum aren't large enough are important enough or have resources enough to have their own industrial policy and make it successful. And so the two regions, one of which you're really an expert in, Latin America, is let's say the Southern Hemisphere, both Africa and Latin America, what is their prospect for regional pacts and regionalization since their attempt to set up regional trading blocks really haven't panned out, have they? Sure. Um, so actually, I think if you're a small economy, you need regionalization even more. Um, then if you're a bigger economy, and partly the United States has done okay and done fairly well until recently, is because it was such a big economy and we didn't we have our own market. We don't need other markets. But you know, if you're Belgium, you know, if you're Italy, if you're Taiwan, if you're South Korea, if you're Cambodia, all of these need to be, if you really want to industrialize, if you really want to climb the value added chain, you need to be hooked into to these other um, to other countries. You need the economies of scale and you need, or you would hope that you would get other countries to bring their manufacturing processes, their technology and transfer, their managerial know-how, their other kinds of expertise that then would allow your workers, your companies, your parts suppliers and the like to, to become part of that supply chain. And I think that's a big story of why, you know, Taiwan and South Korea, which were much poorer than Brazil or Argentina or Mexico in 1960, 1970, um, why today that's no longer the case. So, so I think actually as a small country, this is even more important than, than not. Um, now, what are the prospects for Latin American countries or, or African countries? Right now, we haven't really talked about this. Right now, I see this you know 40 year supply chain path. Um, I see it changing. Um, and over the last decade, we've seen all kinds of new forces starting to change the globalization of the sort of 80s to the 2010s. And these are things like automation, um, which is coming into all these processes, which is making labor in many industries less important as an overall part of your costs. It's changing demographics where places where labor used to be cheap, like China, are no longer so cheap and are not going to become cheaper and going to the future. Um, these are issues like climate change, both the effects of climate change that make you know paths across the sea with seas rising and other things expensive as well as the policies to combat climate change which you know are adding cost to every extra mile you go um, as you pay taxes you know border adjustment taxes and, and the like um, and then you add in geopolitics right geopolitics is forcing a sort of once in a generation 
reshuffle of supply chains. You know, they were settled in in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, and now we're seeing a reshuffling because the US and China are going their separate ways, other types of policies are changing. So all of that is, I think there's a huge opportunity right now for those that didn't benefit over the last 40 years, for those who were left on the edges of supply chains, like Latin America, like Africa, to get back in the game, to be able to participate. But I, there's lots of things they need to do, and we can talk about those. They need to change policies. They need to improve education. They need to build infrastructure. Um, but one thing they need to do is turn to their neighbors. And no one in Latin America, Mexico aside, but the rest of Latin America has not turn to each other. You know, less than 15% of their trade is with their neighbors. Uh, and the challenge there, which is your issue of small countries, is they can't reach that economy of scale. So, you know, Chile is a great country and they have lots of natural resources and they could and should win the green transition because they have all kinds of things there. But big companies aren't going to think about not just taking lithium out, but processing the lithium there, unless you can see it as a continent-wide initiative, right? Or see it as economies of scale. So you can bring in Peru, or you can bring in Brazil, and vice versa. So I think there's a huge opportunity there. I'm a little skeptical that the politics will allow this to happen, but but I do think all of these places that were left on the edges um, have a chance again. Okay, great. Uh, so let's go to Ed. Um, uh, thank you for your talk today. Uh, I have a question how you measure like things that are harder to measure, like IP. When you talk about globalization, I, I'm sitting there in Berlin and I go to Google and I want to order a phone, which is designed in Cupertino and built possibly in Shanghai. But actually, these days they were selling at the Freeport in Kinshasa. <laughs> right. So that's what I think. We're talking about IP and things like that. How do you measure that? Thank you. Sure. So those are harder. Just the databases aren't out there. Um, but you do see the movement of information is much more regional than one would think. So when people do internet searches, when they do Google searches, you can search websites that are in Kinshasa, but you're much more likely to search websites that are based in Canada if you're here in the United States. And if you're in Germany, the same thing, you're much more likely to check out, you know, the French website for Concord than you are to really go and look at the website for, for Walmart and the like. So you see with the movement of information, a regionalization that's pretty, pretty strong as well. Um, and then in the IP, I mean, there are, I'm not arguing that there isn't globalization. Of course there is, right? And we have big companies like Google, right? Where you where you see that, sure. Um, but you see many of the, not the high profile companies, you see lots of more economic activity and sort of the adapting of patents and royalties uh, closer to home. Um, and I think, you know, Apple is a great example here. So Yes, the, the design and the intellectual property is, is based in California, um, but the making of all those products is pretty tightly in Asia, and, and the supply chains there have become so strong that they're very hard to move. And in fact, Apple was trying to bring a MacBook Pro back to make it in North America, to make it you know, in the United States, um, and they literally had to go back to Asia for want of a screw. So one of those little screws on the bottom, they just couldn't find anybody here to make it. And so they went back and, and went back to Asia. And so it's all made there. Um, and interestingly, when you look at sort of the trade stats, um, when a product comes in from Mexico to the United States, so imported to, from the United, to the United States from Mexico, on average, 40% of that product, the value of that product was made in the United States. So there's so much back and forth you can see in that. When a product comes in from China, less than 5% of that product was made in the United States. Because when they make things, they look for suppliers around Asia. And part of that 5% is the IP from Apple, right? That, so you can imagine lots of products, there's zero, right? I, that IP is you know, part of that 5% that's on average. So I think there, there are definitely global companies. There, is de there are definitely global services and the like, but they're much more regional than, than you would commonly assume. Okay, so uh, we're going to go to Alan, and then we're going to take a break and get a question from Zoom, and then we will see how we're doing with time. Um, I just don't want to keep people standing for <laughs> too long. So, Alan, go ahead. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks for coming to speak with us. Um, I'm a guy who just likes to hear solutions if possible. So my question <laughs> is, if you had three minutes in a private meeting with President Biden to advise on trade policy, what would you tell him? A good question. Yes, <laughs> I, I I have a list. <laughs> I would tell him we need to build the infrastructure to link North America's economies because that 
infrastructure and logistics cost money and if you can make it uh, more seamless. So that means, you know, we just approved an almost $2 trillion infrastructure bill. There's lots of stuff we need to do in the United States, and that's for sure. But we should also be linking uh, to the countries on the other side of the border to make it easier to get back and forth between those countries. So that's one thing. Uh, we also, hard infrastructure and digital infrastructure, that should, that should be part of it. Um, I would, you know, one of the biggest advantages today, and we really see it today with the Russia-Ukraine war, uh, is that energy in North America is plentiful and cheap, and we should make sure that that continues, um, and we build in renewables, but that we also do that in a continental way of thinking about things. Um, the other issue, this is my wish list, so, you know, you can think about the politics of this, but, you know, <laughs> As supply chains go regional, so do workforces. You need to be able to follow the goods and the pieces and parts that are moving back and forth. So I would make it easier for work-based visas for people to move on different sides of the border so you can make sure that industries have, have the workforces they need. And I would also think about positioning North America, the continental workforce. You want companies to come and locate here. You need the whole workforce. You know, Asia, you think about going there because you have all these pieces and parts. Think about that here, right? Creating these ecosystems. So I would do that. Uh, and then diving down, you know, the we have seen these other bills passed, the CHIPS Act that you talked about, where there's 50 plus billion dollars of money for semiconductor chips. Um, there's the in, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, which really has nothing to do with inflation, has all to do with the green economy. There you've got, you know, I think, what is it, $396 billion that's going to be spent on various subsidies for, for you know, greening the economy. I would make sure that that money um, goes beyond Buy American and goes and looks a little bit more North American, because if you're going to set up those supply chains are not just one, you know, one uh, semiconductor, you know, fab in Arizona. They're all the parts from the mining of the raw materials to the testing and packaging. And so thinking about that, uh, in a broader framework. Um, one is going to be more affordable, um, so you're going to be able to be more innovative. Two, it's going to be more resilient because putting everything in the same place, you know, if there's a hurricane, it means all of it goes down and makes it less vulnerable. Um, but that is also how to um, build this integration. That was more than three minutes, but that's what I'd tell. <laughs> okay, uh, so we're going to get one from Zoom and then Royal, if you want to ask your question uh, after that. Absolutely. Thank you. The question from Zoom uh, goes as... With U.S.-China decoupling becomes the overall trend in the foreseeable future, do you think the globalization will only occur in the free world? Should the U.S. support a potential economic cold war? Thank you. So I do think that the distancing between the U.S. and China is at the beginning, not the end. I think we're going to see more and more policies. And I think you're starting to see companies making decisions on that basis, that tariffs are here to stay. A, some export controls are here to stay, you know, looking into investments, all these things are here to stay. And, and it's coming from the U.S., but it's also coming perhaps even more from China. So they are doing the same thing. So even if the U.S. pulled back, China, I think, would continue on the self-sufficiency push. Um, so that would to stay. You know, I, though, see, you know, does this lead to, I think it leads to opportunities, as I talked about, for many countries who have sort of been left off the table. Um, but I also see China especially looking to deepen its regionalization and its hold on a lot of countries. So it's not just the U.S. And, you know, does this mean that the U.S. and the West are going to be together? I think China is really focused on countries in Asia and, and trying to draw them into its orbit um, and create a, a place where it has a lot of dominance. So you see this, they've signed uh, free trade agreements with, with 13 other countries in the region. There's the RCEP, it's the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, um, but it's a, you know it's a, it's a free trade agreement that really brings together and and focuses particularly on supply chains and and through you know what econ what trade economists call rules of origins, so sort of where things have to come from and the percentages from what country. It ties those countries together. Um, they are looking to get into uh, what's called the CPTPP. This is a Mm -hmm. trade agreement, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership that the Obama administration negotiated, but we never uh, got into, um, that China has applied to, to join that. I'm not sure they will, but, but they're sort of pushing forward and they are putting a ton of money into the Belt and Road Initiative, which is a lot of money to build infrastructure and the like, which also ties those countries. Um, while they're global in this, most of that money, the majority of that money has been spent in Asia. So it also has a regional bent. So Long story short, I do, I see whatever the U.S. does, I see a divide happening. I think it's happening from both sides. So it's not the U.S. to decide if it's a Cold War. I think you already see China pulling away. Um, but we're going to have competition um, in sort of finding uh, those that would become sort of part of the group that, that will interact with more commercially. 
Okay. Okay. I've uh, noticed that the uh, in places like Africa, for example, the real problem is not going to be regionalization because they don't have the ability to do it. They don't have the infrastructure. They don't have the the political structure that's needed. They don't have the financial structure. Everywhere where China goes into a place like Africa, they build those pieces for themselves to use. Uh, we already have infrastructure established between Canada and Mexico and the United States, and we even have some in South America. I don't see it producing a problem, a, a solution for us. What do you see our path for in in both in Africa and in South America in those areas? Is that Raul was talking about earlier, uh, for getting a successful economy and a success for the United States at the same time. Sure. So, you know, you do see efforts in Africa to try to regionalize. And in fact, they signed a comprehensive free trade agreement that includes almost all the countries in Africa um, just a couple of years ago. Um, we'll see where it ends up, but it, if, if the bones of it are not bad um, as these things go. So, I think there is some effort there. I mean, you're, I, take to heart and, and, and fully agree that, you know, the politics of some African countries are, are um, volatile, let's say. Um, in fact, I have a great colleague at, at CFR who's starting this book. Um, well, it's funny, they're less volatile than one would think. Um, she maps out uh, the either single rulers or, or family dynasties or one party rule that actually is very stable um, over many, many years. So sort of it's actually um, uh, very rigid and that's a challenge. She sees it sort of volatility to come. Um, but um, but overall, I, I take your point, right? It's very hard. And the challenges for an Africa or Latin America is infrastructure. I mean, one of the biggest costs for companies is logistics costs, right? And I was on a panel a while ago with um, the head of Caterpillar and, and I was chatting with him before and he was telling me, you know, when we put a plant, wherever we put it in the world, it's the exact same plant. So it doesn't matter if it's in Cambodia or it's in Kentucky or it's in Berlin, you know, outside of Berlin, it's the exact same plant. But what kills us and what we really, you know, model for when we decide a location is logistics because that costs so much. And of course they are heavy machinery. So logistics do cost a lot, but, but that really is a challenge. And so I look at the Africa's and I look at Latin America's and the like, and, and that is a huge cost that they really need to resolve. Um, Africa's gonna have this huge demographic uh, it could be bonus, right? It's going to, it's the fastest growing in sort of age group. You know, you're going to see Nigeria become the second most populous country in, in 20 years in the, in the world. This is a huge potential bonus, but also potential pitfall if they aren't able to harness that um, with, you know, education and the like. So I, so I definitely see some of those challenges. I would say, um, yes, we have infrastructure, but shockingly, it does not connect us as well as it could to Mexico and Canada. And so the U.S. overall has pretty low-cost logistics, um, and, and that's the benefit. We have, you know, well, when the Mississippi isn't drying up as it is right now, we have good waterways and the like, um, but the connections are, are, you know, notoriously bad with the border. We just had, you know, I guess five years ago, they built a railroad crossing um, across Laredo and Nuevo Laredo. It was the first railroad crossing built in a century, um, even though the amount of trade had gone up so many fold. Um, you have places at the border where, you know, the U.S. has built this fantastic spent, you know, $20 million to build this, you know, cold chain storage area for fruits and vegetables and the like. And the, they never talk to the Mexicans, so there's nothing on the Mexican side, so no one can use it because it doesn't go through and end up closing it. Um, the same with you know, the Canadians. We have places where a two-lane road comes up to a superhighway and, and you don't have the crossings. And so I think they're, um, you know, it sounds like a little, you know, just a few billion dollars, but you know, when you're looking at infrastructure of $2 trillion being spent, you know, 10, 20 billion dollars where you could really make these connections work um, are important. And some of it's not even the physical infrastructure. Some of it is, you know, um, the El Paso customs work from, you know, nine to five, and then the Mexican ones work from 10 to six. And so you can't cross anybody between those two hours that are on this side. So it's, it's cooperation between the governments to make sure that, that you have, you know, customs and the other kinds of, of, of you know, procedures and regulations that, that those are, are speeded through digital, you know, mapping digital um, or complementary systems and things like that. Okay, thank you. Um, this may be our last question. We're going to go to uh, Diego, who is our colleague at Well Boston and a student at Northeastern. I'll make my question super briefly. How are the negative effects of the IMF and the World Bank intervention seen in Latin America today? Mm, that's a good question. 
you know, we see different approaches The you know, the IMF, the World Bank, um, I think the, you know, are held up as the bogeyman second only to the United States, depending on where you are. <laughs> um, and it's, you know, it is often, dare I say, uh, you know, those who are having their own problems, it's better to turn and say it's those people fall over there and why not the IMF or why not the United States? Um, but, you know, as you look at sort of economic development, you look at some of the Asian models, you know, I think a lot of it is is uh, misplaced, but there's a little bit of a seed of truth there. And and, the, and in Latin America, you saw um, a good number of countries or those countries that, you know, really opened up their economy, really opened up their capital markets, really opened up um, sort of went for, you know, we'll just be competitive and get our competitive advantage. And what you have seen in Asia is countries, you know, they were able to, if you look at countries like South Korea and Taiwan, and they were incredibly poor agricultural countries. And now they are, you know, at the top of the semiconductor um, food chain, which, you know, we, the United States have decided is the ultimate food chain to be, to be leading. Um, so I think there is a space for some sort of industrial policy. And the challenge is not to do what Latin America often did in the 1960s and 70s, which, you know, they called import substitution industrialization, which was basically throw up high tariffs and protect industries that were rather inefficient. Um, and to be a little bit more ruthless with it, which, you know, some of the Asian economies were able to do. Others were not. They tried and they they were not. They, they you know, fell down with sort of crony capitalism where, you know, the president's friends, even if they weren't very good at it, still got money and still got loans and the like. So, you know, I think there is a role um, for, for some of this in, in some of the Latin American countries, though I would lean more towards can you fix the general economic environment in ways that lots of people can compete. So can you build better roads and ports and digital connections? Can you build, um, can you uh, provide education that is for a 21st century workforce, not a 20th century one? Um, can you make sure that there is cheap, affordable and clean energy so that companies can come and choose Latin America? And I think there are a lot of places that that could happen. So sort of a general business environment is an important place to start. And then perhaps, um, and then I would say what I would ar argue for them and is, um, can you start with clusters? Can you start with, you know, the United States is going to spend $50 billion on semiconductors. Can Latin American countries or a Latin American country come and say, you know what, we can do the packaging and testing. We'll train the people. We'll work with our universities and your companies. We'll provide them money for five years to come here and let's get this started. And then maybe they'll, you know, something can grow out of it. So that's where I would take it. Um, but, you know, as I look at the IMF and as I read some of their reports, their their tune has changed too, and they're talking about this. They talk about you know public investment crowding in private investment, so bringing private investment rather than public investment crowding out private investment. So I think they are on this page too. You're seeing sort of a general change in in the in the demeanor. Um, that doesn't mean that uh, leaders who need somebody to blame won't still blame them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, well I'm going to try and squeeze in a quick question, um, and that is you know, in, in an era of unbelievable things. Uh, this seems like a long time ago, but not too long ago, an unbelievable thing was Brexit. Um, so uh, what is Brexit, te Brexit teaching us about regionalization? I think Brexit is the, you know, exception that proves the rule or the mistake that proves the rule. So, you know, you have seen, um, I, I don't know, I feel like watching British politics is like, it makes you feel better about US politics, right? <laughs> like going through prime ministers, like, oh, it's Tuesday, who's the new prime minister? <laughs> so, um, but part of this, I mean, part of this is their own politics, but, but part of this, I think there's an element of the challenges that Brexit surfaced um, in that, you know, the biggest, the best thing that happened to Britain, frankly, um, was as, you know, as colonialism was ending, as you know, the empire was fading, is that they were brought into the European community at the time and then, and then the EU. And by doing that, they got access to, you know, a market of 430, 440 million people um, without regulation, you know, with much lower regulations, you know, the common market without tariffs and the like. And this, you know, not huge island, um, was hooked in and was able to, you know, provide financing, be parts of, you know, these supply chains um, that led to, you know, the biggest uh, manufacturing exporter in the world, which is the European Union. So they had a huge advantage there. And by taking themselves out of it, 
um, they're realizing that, you know, there's all these frictions. It's no longer all that competitive to put yourself in, in the UK. And also, you know, people who think about going to the UK, you have access to the UK, you know, they may have you know, just signed an agreement with India. So maybe we'll access to India, though it's not a very deep free trade agreement. Um, but you don't have, why not just go to France or why not just go to Germany? Why not go to Ireland where you have full access to, to the rest of the, of, of Europe. And so I think there's the challenge they're finding. They're also having a challenge of drawing people mm-hmm. to, to the UK, right? Before, you know, you, nobody, you don't have a purple passport anymore, so you can't come that way. Um, but it's, you know, it's an economy that's, that's stagnant, that's not that productive, that doesn't have the ties to, to Europe that it used to have. So I think lots of companies are, are thinking twice. And, you know, you're seeing companies leave uh, Europe mm-hmm. or leave mm-hmm. the UK. I mean, the, my favorite one is Lloyd's of London is no longer in London, right? It has moved out, at least its headquarters to Europe because it wants to be part of the banking union and, and sort of the rules that are that are in um, the EU. It's a better place for them. So I, you know, I, I don't know if Brexit was the worst decision ever, but it's definitely on the top 10 in sort of world decisions recently. Okay, thank you. Wow, Voice of London is not in London. <laughs> add, add that to the list of unbelievable things. All right, well, my friends, um, I'm afraid that uh, this portion of our evening has come to an end, uh, but please join me in thanking uh, very much uh, Shannon K. O'Neill. And uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Zoomers, for being with us. Holidays are coming, great present. Um, I think we're putting a link up for buying the book. Um, if I'm not mistaken, online. And uh, then folks in the room, um, we have the opportunity to do that over in the corner. So everyone will see you on December 14th uh, at Boston Public Library uh, for uh, Climate Change with Rachel Kite. And until then, uh, thanks very much. Good night.